welcome back to another very special episode of the Film Alchemist Podcast, the show where we look at movies we love, break them apart, to find out what gives them their magic. I'm your host, Josh Griffey, joined as always by my co-host and huge Huey Lewis fan, Alex Dandino. I was more of a Phil Collins before he went commercial fan, but before that, a little business, guys. Uh, this is the second part of our double feature. Thank you, Aaron Klepfer, for the recommendations. He's one of our patrons, guys. We're officially on Patreon. That is patreon.com slash film alchemist pod. For as little as a dollar a month, you can dip your toes in with us, see how you like the community, see what we're working on. And then as you go up our official Highlander ranking system, you get to choose the very exact movies you want us to discuss. Uh, it's the best way to help the show, guys. Uh, it's the best way to help us give you the show that you want and deserve. So for those of you who support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash filmalchemistpod, thank you. For those of you who are about to, thank you as well. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Film Alchemist. You can see video versions of most of these discussions there. And we're always working on cool new ideas for content there as well. So uh, go subscribe there. You can email the show, filmalchemistpod at gmail.com. You can find us on all the social media you're on. We're very easy to get a hold of, and we love talking to you guys. So get at us. All right. Enough of that. I was trying to listen to the new Robert Palmer tape, but my co-host Griffey wouldn't shut up with all this cool news. Here. <laughs> I thought you were just bored. Sorry, a little. Yeah. Sorry, a little internal monologuing for old Dan Nino here. I thought you were just really bored of hearing me do the intro. I didn't realize we were in the midst of a bit. Right? Bit! And hey, I'm not here to axe murder bits. I'm very pro bits. <laughs> All right, so today we are, uh, we just did the game, so I hope you guys found that and listened to it. Download that. It's also available today. Aaron picked a good one. This is the uh, scary out of control white man double feature. We're closing it down with American Psycho. Uh, Christian Bale giving what yep. is probably the best performance of his career, if we're being honest. It, yes. It's a just really stunning. Except uh, for Rescue, Don. <laughs> I mean, Sorry. maybe. Maybe. Maybe whatever he was trying to sell us. In you know what? Sorry, I'm going to say Noah. Noah. And How dare you? No All right, uh, we're already on. Wait, <laughs> sorry. Who was not Noah? He was um, what, uh, whatever. Whatever other white guy was supposed to be in one of those. Some other white guy who was very handy and had a large selection of tools. But <laughs> so I watched this with my Moses. wife who he was had Moses. never Sorry. seen it, right? She had never seen what? this movie. And at age 37, watching her react to this movie, I don't know if it was that or what, but it gave me a, a renewed vigor for this film. It is dark and funny and surreal. Yeah. And the pacing is phenomenal. And there's a really fun... It's a really fun movie, especially knowing that it was directed by a woman, right? Because it kind of takes this horror movie directed male woman, gaze and inverts it, written which by makes two women. a big difference. There's just so much to love in this movie. Alex, opening thoughts on American Psycho. I love American Psycho. This movie is... I, I've never read the book because uh, I find Brett Easton Ellis's writing terrible. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> what? What? How dare yeah, you? I, I find him I find him insufferable to be honest. But with Mary you. Heron but did it for great. you. Mary Heron. Well, Mary Heron and Guinevere Turner wrote the script. I think Mary Heron's an exceptionally awesome director, and this one particularly is great that she ended up doing it. Like like the story, the production story behind this movie being made is one of my all time favorite like back and forths. Because this was originally this was going to be like a Cronenberg movie at one point, which really I cannot imagine what this would have been like. Uh, <laughs> and then, uh, like for a long time, Lionsgate was like, "It has to be Leonardo DiCaprio. He's the only one who can do this movie." And they're like, "And Mary Heron the entire time was like, it has to be Christian Bale. Like Leonardo DiCaprio is a star. He has to do it." Finally, DiCaprio went and did The Beach with Danny Boyle. And I think Oliver Stone was going to be the director. And then at the last minute, Oliver Stone bailed after Leonardo DiCaprio. Could you got imagine this is no, an Oliver Stone cannot, movie? Cannot. Wow. It makes no sense. If but we didn't Ma lose the Mary Heron version, I'm like this much interested to see that. I mean, it would just be a mixtape, wouldn't it? Like it would just be like, <laughs> a, 
Because this is he'd what, just this be like, is, been here, done that. Because <laughs> this is what they would have shot it in '99. It came out in 2000. So yeah, it literally would have been like a fucking mixtape movie. It would have been very weird. It would have been probably really, really oddly paced. But with Mary Heron doing this movie, it's a really sleek, hilarious, intentionally so in a lot of ways, uh, urban thriller about the worst. Just the this the worst time to like the the best time to be a white guy in America, the worst time to like have to watch white guys in America. It's well there's there's a, terrifying. Yeah, there's a setup of this film that starts off right away, right? Because this is the the opening is just the the white boys club, right? So we start off with yeah. our kind of fancy blood opening, and then we're in this douchey restaurant. And this movie again, very much like Michael Douglas's essence, let's say essence. <laughs> I'm just triggered immediately because I well, hate this is these greed people. is good. This I is hate the, the this white, is the era I hate of the Wall rich Street. people story. I fucking hate these things, but this one gets to a use that to good effect, right? Yeah, but it's just these fucking douchebags talking, 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 and they're going for it. But what it does is you immediately know. I think, and this is the Mary Heron touch, right? Is this is not a movie that right away is. They're not being showed to us as these kind of oh, that's what we should aspire to, right? This no. capitalist fucking ladder climbing bullshit that a lot of these movies ascribe to. No. They are showing us exactly what they are, that these are these fucking like J crew mannequins come to life. <laughs> it's it becomes apparent within, I don't know, five seconds of them all sitting at lunch that absolutely none of these guys have ever done a hard day's work like ever. Like none of these guys have ever done anything to get to where they are. They just are where they are because they are handsome and white i forgot that patrick right bateman's dad owned the company essentially well it's like it's thrown in there really quietly yeah. and that's like the bit too like all these guys also my personal favorite like underdog hero of this movie is justin thoreau we'll get to that later but he has like a couple of awesome like lines the scene in the when he's like snorting blow and he yells at the guy in the cell next to him and he's like sorry the sorry, steroids steroids <laughs> i was like yeah, dude, he's fucking great in this movie. That and they, I mean, he's just an, like, there's a scene, we'll get to that, I, I'll get to it later, but, like, this opener is so important, because, like, not only is it, even from the opening credits, like, the opening credits are this, like, hilariously misleading bit, and, like, I feel like anywhere else it would seem you a know, little like hacky. like Fancy Blood? No, no, I was, what I was saying is, I feel like anywhere else it would seem a little hacky, but they keep up the facade long enough where you're like, Oh, it's they're making like fancy lunch for the fancy people. And then like it goes like it's the tone is set from the fucking opening credits, man. Like you don't even have to wait for the movie to start to know what kind of movie you're going to watch. And it's really, really fascinating because yeah. then you get into the yuppie talk and all these guys are literally all they're talking about is. Where to go to get where to get the good blow? I mean, that's like sixty. Where to go to the movie is making reservations. That's I mean, that's it's it. Yeah. And like the obsession with this place, Dorcia, which we never go to, which is half the fun of the movie. Like We're it's a bit invited. in the movie. We're not invited. We are we are plebs. Yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just it's incredible. And then you cut to. The, the internal monologue bit, which right. is our first and, real, like, well, this is the funny part, incredible. right? Is I had absolutely, yeah, I had forgotten how surreal this movie is almost immediately. And mm -hmm. I know that, you know, me and you will argue at the end about what parts of this we think are real and are not. I don't think we're on the same page on that. Probably but not. The argument to be made is that there's almost no truth in the entire film, right? I mean, this is about as unreliable a narrator as possible. But not even that. Yes. This whole movie is played through the lens of this is how Patrick Bateman, a fucking serial killing psychopath, sees other human beings. So it would make sense that they're all these two dimensional, callow caricatures. Yeah. Because that's if you don't have empathy and you are an actual psychopath, that's how you see the world. But what it does is it adds this layer of unreality to it, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, just things – there are rare moments where you start to see truth, and that's when he's looking in mirrors often. Like the opening scene, he tries to hand, like, some coupons to a bartender. She's like, you fuck, it's cash bar. And he goes, I want to cut your belly open and play with your blood a little bit, some weird line like that. And then just smiles as she comes back because this is the other constant thing, right? The fact that it's all – 
these these well laid upon ruses and rituals mm -hmm. is the fact that when he does tell people what he is, no one ever can accept that this guy in that outfit with those fucking cheekbones can be Leatherface. Right. I mean, I think that it's there's another layer to this, and I think one is the this like the scene in the um the club when he shouts at her. There's another level of this too, which is like I've not been in many nightclubs, but I've been in enough to know that like people just shout random shit all the time. So like it it would make a lot of sense that someone would shout that and a bartender would literally be like, I don't give a shit what you have to say. They, yeah. they're like, you still have to give me cash. Like, I don't know what you want me to do about this. Well, they play it so, a like, bunch of times that they just don't hear him when he says that. Yeah. They do that later when he says uh, murders and executions instead of murders. Yeah. It actually is my rare superpower in life is that I've never been in a club or concert where you cannot hear me perfectly. I can reach um, a volume. That it's not perfect. a superpower. It's It's just you. Um, I know it's. Amazing. I've been around. I've been around you a lot, and I've been around you in a lot of those places. It's just you. Um, <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> but again, it's. Uh, I mean, but the other layer to that, though, is that as you find out through the movie, and again, Patrick's dad owning the business and that kind of thing, you find as you find out through the movie, not only is Patrick like the most vain person in existence, possibly. But that also he is not particularly well liked. He has fashion friends. He doesn't have real friends. He doesn't really have a girlfriend. He has a girlfriend by way of needing a girlfriend because that's what people do. And that is a form of psychopathy. But then the other part of that is quite frankly, and they put it this way perfectly towards the end of the movie. He's like, he's a loser. Yeah, they keep calling that's him it. a dork. Because that is one yeah. of the really fun. Because that it's the strange thing. You're like, I don't even know that you can call it vanity, because it's not yeah, his true <laughs> self, right? But it's it's vanity for an outward performance, right? Because he's crafting this character he thinks are what these other people want, so he can swim amongst this fucking well, well stocked pond of victims. This goes to this goes to well this goes to the considerable contention you and well, i have what's about the opening what line right is. where he says there is an idea of patrick there's Bateman, an idea and of patrick it, Bateman, and then he says Bateman. but i am simply not there and sure. i thought that was a beautiful i mean that's a great theme to state at the start of the movie where you're like fuck yeah and right. then we go on the journey from there well i mean to me it's um again it's i mean just be yeah i don't know it's you want to really, do it? You're rearing for a fight, Ferdinand? Is that what's happening? It's not a fight. It's simply like <laughs> it's a statement. Of, it's a statement of what the movie actually is. And I think that's like the really difficult thing. And that's a really fun thing about American Psycho is like these conversations are had because the movie is quite frankly, if you watch it from a certain angle, it's a horror movie. If you watch it from another angle, angle, it's a satire of the 80s. If you watch it from a third angle, even it's a satire of wealth. It's a it's a commentary on wealth and what it does to people. All these other things like yeah. there's so much there's so many layers to the movie. So I think it's it's interesting because I've I think I've watched, I mean I own like the unrated version. Like I have owned this movie since I was probably naughty, in high naughty. school. Yeah. Like there's like you know there's just I I've, I've watched I think I watched this movie whenever it's on I'll just watch it cuz I just laugh my ass off. But like that's what this movie is is it's a oddly rewatchable movie that ends up being multi-layered every time you watch it. And the, the more I watch it, the more fascinated I am by the fact that at, at like, I can tell you the first time I watched it, I took everything at face value. There was absolutely nothing about this. I'm like, that is fucking crazy. But then I watched it more and more and more. And the more I analyzed it, yes. Like I became convinced with the with a lot of other people that, most of the things that happen to Patrick Bateman in this movie are not real. They happen in his mind. I think there's definitely the, the frenzy moment, right? Where he, uh, the ATM says, feed me the cat. He shoots a lady. He starts shooting cops and janitors and the cop car explodes. Even and, he doesn't uh, believe that. Well, he looks at the gun as if it is a, you know, fucking wizard's wand, right? Yeah. Like he was a, and I get that. And then that scene is he makes the call and does his confession. There's a police spotlight that's just frozen on his office window, right? Mm -hmm. None of that probably happened. We know that that confession call happened. 
We yes. know something. So this is, I think there are touchstones. I'll tell you one of the weirdest things in the movie today was with Paul Allen's uh, family, the detectives and this and that, uh-huh. is the way I see it, I actually think that, because at the end we see Paul Allen's hotel room has become this fucking Hewitt family, you know, villa, where there's just uh-huh. dead bodies everywhere, dead girls on hangers and bathtubs, die, yuppie, whatever. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it is a fucking nightmare show. Yeah. No, it's straight up Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Right, and there are two ways to watch that, right? Like, how long were those women in the apartment and they didn't detect any of this, right? Right. Which I think you can explain away. There's a really strange scene, though, at the end when he comes back and he's all sweaty. And he walks in and the realtor tricks him and knows that he's not here to see the apartment, right? And he's at the closet where the dead bodies were. And she goes, you know, what are you really doing? He's like, does Paul Allen live here? And she goes, not anymore. All right, well, something had to happen. If all of this is going down, I got a real vibe that his family was just trying to hush this up and that they thought Paul Allen had committed these crimes. I mean, and so this was there like because she knew something was off, mm -hmm. right? Where she's like, you know, you came here looking for trouble. We don't want that. She says a couple sentences. I was like, holy shit. This lady knows that something extra has occurred. There's another there's because like the detective Kimball Mm -hmm. played by Willem Dafoe. There's a whole other beat that, um, and he knows. Like where he's like, he knows. <laughs> knows what? He, I think he he's on to Bateman the first scene. So he does that great line where he goes eerie, just eerie. And I think that's a shot at Bateman where he's like, I know you're a fucking creep. Well, that's what detectives do for one. That's but true. also, like to me, this movie functions on this movie. Like the everything happening outside Patrick Bateman functions on Occam's Razor. The simplest solution is usually the right one. More than likely, Paul Allen being a super rich yuppie guy literally just went to London to fuck off for a little bit. That's it. Like, I could buy that, and a lot of that makes sense. Like, there's there's not a, like, then this is like, this is the hard part about the movie. Because, like, we can just skip to, like, okay, so Jared Leto, for one, plays, like, the best asshole. I mean, I wanted to kill him at the end of the movie. Like, I was just like, like... At the end of that scene when they're at that restaurant, I'm like, God, I just want to fucking murder yeah. you. This was the first, like, I, he's like Marvin the Martian, like, I claim these roles for me forever. I will always be the biggest cock in every movie. <laughs> and just fucking it's, took that it's shit. It's so great. Well, like, <laughs> and I mean, like, everything leading up to that, too, is, again, and I don't, like, the brand name. This is, like, my my dad, um... My dad is a corporate lawyer, and whenever we watch this movie, he'll just laugh. He's like, you have no idea how many of these assholes I've had to, like, sit across from in meetings. And just, like, I know they're, like, sitting there just be like, hmm, my watch is great. I have all of her people's glasses. I have a Hugo Boss suit. Like, it's just, like, all these, like, things. Mm-hmm. And, like, so for me, like, that scene, the first time we see Jared Leto when he walks in, and he mistakes Patrick Bateman for this guy named Marcus Halber- Halberstrand. That to me is like the first that to me is the first give of the entire movie where you're like, okay, so there's a pretty good chance that whoever Patrick Bateman is, like he says in the beginning, there's an idea of a Patrick Bateman. There's absolutely none of all these guys are faceless. It doesn't really matter. Right. Like you this could is, switch to any <laughs> single one of them. This is absolutely every scene is just like Stepford Whites. You know what I mean? Like they're all just these interchangeable pod things. Yeah. Right. I mean, like, the, all of them are completely, yeah, all of them are completely interchangeable. But then, so they go to the restaurant, and they do the bit where, <laughs> where he shows, he's like, boy, this place is hot, Halberstrand, it is popping. He's like, J&B straight and a Corona. <laughs> and then he, <laughs> he fucking says, he's like, do you want to hear this? Message? Not if you want to keep your spleen. And you're like, okay, now... In any other movie, that would seem like a horribly odd thing to say and be like, oh, that's crazy. But because these are corporate raiders and stockbroker assholes in the 80s, you're like, I bet one of those assholes said that for sure. Like, there's no Absolutely. way none of them did it. These are all so, captains like, of the world, right? They right. So nothing seems strange. Yeah. Nothing like horrible or mean seems actually outside the realm of possibility because like, you know. Why wouldn't it? Like, I mean, like, of course they're assholes. Like, nothing about threatening someone's life seems odd or out of place because all these guys do that shit all the time. They do that on the phone to strangers. 
Well, I mean, yeah, we, we don't see it a ton, but there's a lot of affairs happening. So you get this, uh, oh, I think God. it was Colleen, right? His side piece. And you're like, what a tragic, st-. like, she just literally is like, there's a scene where he's like, you smoke, you never notice? But she's just like the shell of a person. He takes her to this drunken dinner. And it's almost as if she just gets passed around by these horrible men. Yeah. No, and it's just it's... become addicted to some, and it's, it's just fucking depressing, right? She's one of the only times in the film you see an actual human cost to yeah. some of this behavior besides the the moitas, right? There's a lot of moitering. But um or is there? Oh, there is, for sure. But like start there, right? I for sure he kills Paul Allen. No. For sure he axe murders him in the face. Nope. I absolute cuz there there is a a contention now that happen. you've seen House that Jack built, right? There is a lot of this, but no, there's a scene when he like drags the the corpse behind his van, right? And he leaves blood for miles and miles, and he's like, oh, shit. And then it rains and washes it away, and he's like, in that moment, I knew I was doing an inspired, like, God work. This scene has that through the lobby. Yeah. There's that great tag where he's like, where did you get that overnight bag? Right? Lewis says that. Mm -hmm. I, I think the fact that the movie is playing so loose with this idea that because Patrick Bateman looks like he looks, dresses how he dresses, of course you could get away with this kind of shit. Well, yeah, that's the bit. Of course he would get away with it, but, but the he bit doesn't, doesn't actually work do if it. he doesn't get away with anything. Sure it does. He's a it, it functions on two levels. The bit works because a he could get away with it because he's like a fucking everyman corporate yuppie asshole. But then two, he is such a loser that he has these fleeting fantasies, but would never actually act on them. He just feels them at all times. So this feeling of like murder and this rage that bubbles under the surface of being what a cool rich guy who has like hot people all around you all the time. Yeah. Whatever. That is people all with abs don't think like that. Everything about him is superficial. You have sure. to like everything about Patrick Bateman is superficial, including his like flights of fancy of murdering people. The doorman doesn't notice a trail of blood. The doorman who has just trained himself to serve these rich people and is not used to looking. Nobody the other else way. would notice the trail of blood. It wouldn't show up in the papers. Why? Nothing ever comes up. Why? 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 It's New York. There's fucking deaths all the time. Do you that think all that show up in the paper? Everyone gets re- everything that, gets reported on. But that's what I mean. Do you think that those people's first instinct would be one of us has committed a crime like that? They can't admit it because they're at the fancy bar. They exist and they build themselves as these caricatures to show us that they've made it, right? They're like these false idols sure. on a false Olympus. So mm-hmm. is it easier for them to just say, oh, someone bad did a bad thing way over there, or that one of our own would give all of this up? Reservations at Dorcia to go murder two hookers? I think it's completely plot. Again, I do think it, it is satire. Not obviously, Patrick, ba- Patrick Bateman would not give up a reservation at Dorsey to murder two hookers. I fucking bet he would. Nope, not a yeah. chance. Well, that, I was that waiting is, for him to that make is, one of the hookers. That is assigning. That is assigning a virtue to a character that has none. You are assigning a virtue. You are assigning a virtue to a serial killer like he actually cares about killing these people. I think this he isn't a, desperately cares about killing these people. He cares about killing these people because he feels powerful. Exactly. That's, That's the whole point. Feeling power. Yes. Feeling, That's it. Most serial feeling killer power, psychopathy, however, as you said earlier, comes exactly from power dominating and corrupting something that you feel is less than you. But the power that he wants to wield is the ability to book a reservation at Dorcia. The fact that he has, that he wants to kill Paul Allen is simply because he can get seats and eat that sea urchin ceviche. That's literally the only reason he wants to kill That's him. That's not going to get him in the seat. He's going to kill him because he made fun of Patrick Bateman. Patrick Bateman doesn't even matter enough to know that it's him. Right? Pat- he has a better business card. These are the reasons why he has to die. Sure. All of them are purely vain. I understand that. But I think he absolutely cares about the murders. I think nothing else. And this is the thing, right? You see as the movie goes along, right? As he begins to get more frenzied, right? Like when he just stops off for the quickie with Colleen. Right. Uh, you know, and then the cigars and the fucking drinking and all the shit he does in the movie. You get this right. idea that all of these things, right? These suits and the business card, all of it. They're so fucking fleeting, right? These these 
when you have an appetite like these fucking rich dipshits in this movie, where you always have to have the best suit, the best card, this and that, inevitably someone's going to have the better thing than you really fast, right? There's no winning that game. These are insatiable appetites. And I think what he finds is that for those few mo fleeting moments... That is the only time he is actually appeased in the entire film is like when he kills Paul Allen, he sits down with a cigar. I think that's a, one of the only moments where he feels it himself and happy. But then as you see, this becomes a, I got to have more, more, more. These are people that get whatever the fuck they want all the fucking time. Sure. And it'll never be enough. So that the getting more on edge of the frenzy, and that's how a lot of these serial killers get caught. It just starts to spiral out of control and it's never enough. So I, I personally believe, and the way I also watch a lot of movies too is I was like, the theory that he kills no one and he's just like a fucking accountant in office space just getting angry in his thoughts is not an interesting movie to me at all. Okay. I mean, I don't <laughs> agree with that at all, but I mean, regardless, I mean, I still don't think he kills anyone throughout the movie. Like, it's just... It's absurd. He's well, like, I don't think he kills that lady by dropping a chainsaw on her, right? No, but that's pa we're but that's past the fantasy art. We're so far into a fantasy at that point. Like, yeah. but I would believe off, he killed that hooker, just not in that manner. The one wait, crystal, which right? Which one was the blonde haired one? lady who said she needed surgery after uh, her run in with Sabrina? Yeah, you're talking about. The one he dropped the chainsaw on. Yeah, I'm saying I could totally believe that he had killed her, just not in that manner, right? Because this is one of those fun scenes where he's running through the hall in his fucking, like, new balance, and he's all naked and shit. <laughs> and Amy, my wife, was just like, this is insane. Like, this is not real. Well, no one answers the door. Sure, it's... but then I think about it, though, right? Like, when I lived in L.A., I would hear sounds all the time and be like, nope. Well, no, not that my scene problem. functions That scene functions on that... Um... The conceit of that, like that woman who was screaming be after being murdered in the, like it happened in New York. Mm -hmm. The woman who was screaming being murdered in like a courtyard and no one came down yeah. to help her. That's a big city thing, man. Not my fucking Absolutely. problem. You don't know if they're ready for an audition or some shit. So right. I told her, I was like, that's what I think American Psycho does wonderfully. Is mm -hmm. I think even when it's at its most surreal and possibly absurd, other than the cop car exploding, it's all within the realm of plausibility. And I think that's where great satire works is you have to be able to assume that this guy would do something like that. everything's within the realm of possibility. Like anything this guy does besides, yeah, a car exploding is within any realm of possibility. Yeah. Like he clearly has a mental disorder of some kind. Like it doesn't matter what it is, is I still don't think because everyone's percept. Here's the thing. Everybody's perception of him besides himself is that he's a loser. Mm -hmm. Nobody likes him. These are show for like the scene where he's in the car with Reese Witherspoon's character, Evelyn and bit, the bit I was doing where he's trying to listen to the Robert Palmer tape. And she's like talking about their wedding or whatever. And he's like, I don't give a shit about that. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I, I can't, I can't do that. I have to take time off work. He's like, I don't. And she literally brings it up. She's like, your dad owns the company anyways. I don't even know why you do that. And he fucking pauses. He takes the tape off. The, it's the only thing he cares about at that moment is listening to Robert Palmer. He takes his headphones off. He says, because I want to fit in. I think that it unlocks the entire thing. For me, all of that matters is that Patrick Bateman is part of the group. He doesn't need to be the leader of the group. He doesn't need to be an important person in the group. He just needs to be part of the action. He doesn't give a shit about anything else. Which is why absolutely at no time do I think him actually murdering people comes into play he would not like nobody that vain and nobody that self-important would actually put themselves at risk that way serial killers might do that but that's because they actually are in, at risk this is a guy who never has issues but i think this gets back to something you see a lot in movies about the super wealthy is when you can have anything you want at any like why do they eat those tiny plate foods no one likes that shit that's not how humans should eat you don't like an amuse bish yeah no one fucking likes that shit you know why you eat it so you can put it on instagram and say that you're better than people right and once i have friends that do that so if they're listening i'm fucking sorry but you know it's true 
<laughs> but when you watch these people, right, and they can have anything they want all the time. Hookers, blow, reservations, clubs, just money, fucking apricot, facials, whatever the fuck, right? What does any of that mean then? Right? This is something I always was talking to some guy. Like, uh, he was giving me shit. He's, you know, you're not a real Star Wars fan because you haven't seen every new thing and read every fucking book. And I was like, all right, but you can't quantify it like that. I was like, some kid who has nothing in their life, no toys, no nothing, they could find the worst novelization of, like, episode one, read it, and Star Wars will mean more to that kid than it could ever mean to the biggest collector, has seen everything, whatever, because that's all they have. It's the sc- Sometimes scarcity makes things more valuable. I think that's, you know, pretty standard, you know, economic thought and so these people that have fucking everything right these extreme out on a limb behaviors it's a way for them to feel something it's something that their money can't fucking buy feeling unsafe could be a kink for people like this right and then you mix in the you know if he's actually a full psychotic person and he doesn't believe he's a person exists then why would he care about protecting Patrick Bateman? It only matters in so much as that he can get more victims. Well, he doesn't protect. He doesn't have to protect Patrick Bateman. He literally lets people. He goes around constantly letting people, other than the people who actually know him, people mistake him for other people all the I time. I love that gimmick in the movie. I do too. But that's like the bit. Everybody, it's it's the great. It's one of the great deceptions in the movie is that everybody constantly thinks Patrick Bateman. Anytime they hear something about Patrick Bateman, they're like, eh, impossible. He's like too much of a, he's too milk toast, too much of a loser. He's a dork, like that kind of shit. Like everybody's perception of Patrick Bateman, yes, goes against type. So, of course, no one would think he would be capable of this. But I think that's part of the bit is that not even Patrick Bateman believes he's capable of this. He just likes to think of himself in that manner. It's, this self-fulfilling prophecy. It's this thing we all hope. Like, it's that um, residual self-image. Everybody, like, I think of my when I think of myself, I look at I, I think of what I look like, and then I look at myself in the mirror, and they are demonstrably yeah, different. Where'd that eighty pounds come from? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm like, <laughs> that I'm not that. I'm like, oh, I'm not that fat. And then I look in the mirror, I'm like, yeah. you are that fat. I actually. feel pretty but, good, and then I catch like a side eye of myself in like a store for a yeah. window. I'm like, Gah! Yeah, no, it's horrible. Like, I hate looking at... I, I've seen photos of myself from the side, and I'm like, well, that's just the most depressed I'll ever no. be. So, like, there's levels to Look that. like I Look, went American I- Psycho on the Old Town Buffet. <laughs> <laughs> but for me personally, I don't... It doesn't bother me. Like, I, I, I like having this conversation about whether or not things are real, whether or not... And look, they could be, too. I mean, there's no reason there shouldn't be. Well, the big... However, the, the, the- the big flaw in my theory as it is, is what you take the lawyer's statement to be right. Cause at right. the end he's like, I got your call. It was hilarious. And he says specifically, he's like, I had dinner with Paul Allen twice in London. Right. Into stories. Like stop talking about it. Stop questioning me. Now there's two ways to look at this, right? So earlier detective, uh, pinball Kimball. or whatever his name is. Kimball. Yeah. Kimball. It's not a tumor. He claims that would be funny if in the same universe they were just like brothers working two it'd different. Be fu- beats. It'd be funnier if this was if this was Kimball coming back from the island from the lighthouse. Yeah, any of those. They're all just like an extended family story. <laughs> but uh, so he Fuck said it. it's green, he's that, the Green Goblin. Yeah, right? Paul Allen was in London, but it was a mistaken identity. And there mm-hmm. is this constant people not knowing which of the other Stepford wives they're engaged with. Right, the Stepford Whites. I mean. Right. And I think that really works. So then you're like, maybe the lawyer was confused as to who he was having dinner with. Or maybe this lawyer is representing the Allen estate and all the fucking money and repute. Because, again, all of these people are not real. They only exist as these fucking caricatures they've created. So why Paul Allen could be mistaken what he physically looks like. Everyone knows what Paul Allen represents. Right. He represents Dorcia. And fine taste in business cards and this and that. And that he got the account somehow instead of the guy who's at daddy's company. So could the lawyer be working at behest of that lady who was showing the apartment and maybe had the bodies removed and they're protecting family names? I think that's really interesting to me if that's how it works, right? Um, He says that he saw Paul Allen. So if you don't want to believe that, 
if you're more of a literalist in what people are saying, he's probably the most concrete character we see in the whole film. Right. But I, mean, I just I was I I thought of it for some reason this time watching it, him and the lady showing the apartment made it feel like they were like, Don't fucking push this. We're all gonna get out of well, here okay. Don't fuck this up. Yeah, and I mean I think that's a completely plausible scenario for that. And that's really kind of like to me, that scene is the only real, like, chink in the armor of, like, whether or not this is really happening or not. Because, mm-hmm. like, I do think, yeah, that entire, the entire sequence, uh, the entire, like, sequence of the chase is, like, completely false. There's absolutely no, there's no rationale or reality to it. Just, it's just, and that's fine, like. Well, he could be jumping fl- at shadows because he knows Flights he's- of fancy, that's part of the deal. Absolutely. Yeah. It could totally be that. I actually think the lady showing the apartment. I mean, that makes sense. The lady showing the apartment's the hardest. There's something in that scene that is a lot extra. I think the lady showing the apartment is actually a much harder concrete evidence towards your theory than anything with the lawyer. Because the lawyer is still part of this system. Like, a New York real estate person who's showing, like, ritzy people apartments probably has less bullshit. But, but they also, also probably don't want police and investigators and news sure. snooping around, right? They want, Who knows? Their whole existence is to keep us outside. We can look at them through storefront windows and be like, I wish I was that rich to have that tiny shell plate. But right. we're not allowed to be in the fucking room, right? And so no. there is a cover-up. Of, maybe I watch too many like true crime documentaries. I don't know. But So let me ask you this, right? So the scene when he is mad uh, about his business cards, right, which – the business card bits, by the way, are timeless classic cinema that it will might never be get the old be- to It me. might be one of the best scenes. It's one of the top, like, hundred scenes. I mean, not only, like, sure. symbolically, right, that all of these guys are just business cards for a make-believe name that has no value or weight in the world, right? Yeah. It's such a perfect... But the way they film it, and they're getting in on bail, and he's all sweaty. Actually, my really. favorite line in the entire one is at the very beginning when... <laughs> He fucking unsheaths it from his little card carry, which carries one fucking card. Which, by which the is way, like, I used to have one of those. I used to get them as stocking too. stuffers in like middle school. People would be like, I "You'll probably them. need this as you get to college." I did too. Always, I I don't know, like all of them. It's are good for holding point. paper products, but not yeah. business cards. <laughs> but my favorite line <laughs> again: "Fucking Justin Thoreau comes in real hot." <laughs> just, you hear it unsheathed too. It's like clink. The card unsheath, and then just the you got a gram, like <laughs> <laughs> a coke and steroid guy. Yeah, no, it's oh, but it's dude. just it's brilliant, right? Like even yeah. Lewis when he's like, "How did Lewis get such good taste?" And he goes to choke Lewis, and then Lewis like kisses his wrist, and I was like, Ugh. "Like that's a weird kiss." I love it. Had he kissed him on I, the mouth, I'd have been like, "Perfect, normal." The wrist fell off. But, no, and then, but, okay, so and then he's watching his gloves. Point, yeah, he watches, <laughs> where are you going? I have tapes to return. Ooh, we're going to talk tapes. about this in a minute. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. Let me ask you this then. So here's a more easy one. Do you think he fucking stomps that homeless guy to death and his dog? That's Shanks a tough him one, man. Him? That's a very complicated Because that one is a, it's not amongst his circle. He doesn't have to dispose of the body. Oh. This is a person that we as a country have decided we don't give a fuck what happens to. It blows yeah. my mind every day that we have a billionaire in space and a fucking dick and we let people live on sidewalks. Like, that's just not going to make insane. everyone's life better if people don't have to live on sidewalks. That's neither here nor there. But that's the perfect kind of victim. And it's kind of our moment that sets him up as a true monster. We hint at it with the the red sheets, right? Which is kind of a funny thing. Like, why would you kill someone and take the sheets to get washed? Because his rituals and his item. Well, why fucking... would you kill someone with what in white sheets, anyways? There's well, a I whole think other. This is all part of his like, you know, rituals and you know his item fetish fetishization. Fetish- yeah. First off, never wash a shrew out yeah, of the question. It's just fucking. I don't funny. even. I don't it even know what that is shit great is. Comedy, but. The homeless guy and his dog. Do you think he fucking stomped them out? This is our he's a real monster moment. It's not shot in the abstract or the surreal no. at all. No, it's not. And it's really. It's brutal. It's fast. It's really. It's, it's really difficult. He kills difficult. a dog, which I hate. 
it's probably the only scene in the movie that I find like, I mean, all of them are pretty terrible, I guess. That's not, that's not, I, I can't, I can't say that on air. <laughs> I mean, all of them are terrible. It's the one I've probably find the most abhorrent. Like, well, I, especially if you don't believe the rest of them are real. Yeah. Like, this one I mean, look, real, sexual know. violence against anybody is horrible. And I, I, I hate that shit too, but this one just feels so vicious and cruel that it feels, I mean, it's gotta be, that one's gotta be real, right? I think so. See this, this is where I pin It's tough, right? man. I think a lot of them are real. I don't know that we see them as they occur, right? I think we're living, because the whole movie is us watching through this psychopath's eyes. Right. So I think it is him replaying his, like, horned-up fantasies about what happened, right? So, right. like, when he does the chainsaw kill, that's mm -hmm. probably not how it went down. Do I believe that he killed that girl again? Yes. Because it's weird for us to just go back to the hooker that he already let out of that. It's like a catch and release, right? He tricks him into the house. He does his horrible, like, rants about Phil Collins. And, you know, it's not going to eat Houston. itself, eat it, right? And then when they leave, there's like blood and crying and something horrible happened that we don't yeah. see. Right. Yeah. We're kind of laughing as he's like fucking and like flexing in the mirror. You're like, what a fucking douche. You know, it it seems like uh, human beings having sex is inherently always funny to me. Right. Yeah. There's just no like no one ever looks as cool. There's as never. It's just weird. Yeah. Well, like they do such a good job of representing that when the like when they cut to the video camera feed and they're all like changing positions, they're just, like, like rolling all this around looks and it's not. But that's what I mean. But then all of a sudden we cut from like our kind of, huh, let's laugh at this rich fucking threesome to oh my god, something horrible has happened here. Yeah, and I believe something horrible happened there, right? And when we come back to her, she's like, I might need surgery after last time. So then your mind starts wandering. And it's a strange thing that that's not addressed more, right? We're just kind of left to run with that. There's a really strange scene in the – or a decision in the picking up the hooker segment is it's strange to me that we don't give some kind of human form to whatever's driving that limo. Because it's really weird. When she starts to walk away, the limo just instinctually follows her without him right. telling. And it feels very – like he's the devil himself, right? And like, right. who's in there? What kind of deal does he have with this limo? Is this just another person that's used to serving rich pricks and knows? But to not see, say that well? also precedes. Yeah, I don't know, man. That's a really difficult. strange decision. They never showed just like a a portly fucking like Jets fan, right? Like just sitting there, not saying anything, <laughs> but at least showed a human being. Well, it he doesn't feels even tell like him where to Bateman go. Is that entire car? You know, I, there's a weirdness to that moment. So there right. is surreal, but I think going back to it, right? And I think they did go to Paul Allen's apartment. And I think they did start to party. And because even like when he's going down on the red haired girl, and then all of a mm -hmm. sudden we cut back and he's like a junkyard dog with a steak and there's blood everywhere. I was like, yeah, what? What is it felt not biologically possible? But I was like, I, I believe that. he fucking killed I, whoever that was. Yeah, I'm and sure her. he did. And then, yeah, it's weird that, too, the girl running through the house is seeing his closet o corpses. Yeah. So is that trying to tell us that someone who we think is a real person is butting into these fantasies? Or is that him extrapolating out this more cinematic? Well, I don't know, man. Version? I mean, like, all of it feels very... I, I'm, sure they went, I'm sure they went to Paul Allen's apartment. But, like, the limo is a big red herring for me because like yeah like there's something otherworldly about it and like he doesn't know to go to paul like he doesn't ever speak to the limo driver never a conversation's had like it, it, and it feels, i mean he could in between possibly sure like i'm like i'm sure it could happen off camera i'm not saying it's outside the realm of possibility yeah. but like it feels strange no man I'm with you. it feels very strange like a lot of the stuff a lot of the things like that feel very ethereal. Like yeah, that one that's particularly. That's a great word for it, yes. Everything feels very in the air, and you're not really sure what's real. Like <laughs> It is in the air tonight. <laughs> stop. No, that was before you. Yeah, that was pretty commercial, do you like, though. Do you like Whitney Houston? That like, scene, them, dude. When them he making does the fun Whitney of him. Houston? Them making fun of him for liking Whitney Houston is 
fucking hilarious. But not only that, his, that's him his actually diatribe's like incredible. pouring it out. Yeah. Right? When he's like talking he's, about control of self. I thought that was, and he's like almost emotional, right? And that's how, I thought that was one of the better ones. Because he essentially talks in like New York Times think pieces and Zagat reviews because yeah. he's not a person who's doing things that he likes or cares right. about. He has to pretend. But I thought there was something to the the Whitney one that I liked because the Huey Lewis one, I was like, he's doing Jim Carrey on in living color bit. Like this yeah. is not even like a real man. Did you know Mary, did you know Mary Heron told him not to do that little dance, the little snapping thing. Really? He did it anyway. Since she left it in, like she was like, do not do that. It's way over the top. And he's like, whatever. I mean, it, it is. It's Jim Carrey adjacent. That, yeah. that bit. Right. I think it's, I, it's probably my favorite part of the entire bit. Like it's, ridiculous well he has just these funny like <laughs> when he's like getting more because it feels like that's almost like the little engine that could starting and yeah. his energy is just for, like man it's like the only time you see him excited about stuff is yeah. when he's I, I know it's like kind of gearing up to do shit yeah. but like when he's describing these things because again it's he this, has his fucking designer gallagher fucking poncho. <laughs> it's this like inflated self of it's this inflated sense of self yeah. like where you're, yeah, just like, I mean, how many people do we know who just like fucking rattle off the IMDb page for movies or like, you know, like yeah. just random facts like, oh, well, I know everything about this because it's awesome. It's like, yeah, yeah I get it, man. That's it's, it's great. Yeah. It's like half the comics community. In and the it's world. also funny, like, too, because it lets you know that, again, he thinks that. He thinks it's cool. something that will impress another human being. He thinks nothing that's about how a real that is boy cool. talks. But that's exactly what we go back to is like you and I, we do not anytime we've ever had that conversation, like, are we cool? Like, well, we're of course cool. we're not. We're cool, but everyone else who has that conversation, not cool. <laughs> <laughs> we're dope. We are because cool people not still cool. say they're dope. Because cool people it's still funny, say words like funny. dope. Yeah, we do. We're set I mean, we might <laughs> coolness might be circling back on us, but we'll be here when it's red. Doubt it. But yeah, like it's ultimately <laughs> I mean, it is like this it's fascinating because it is this like person's perception of what's cool. And that again, it goes back to how unreliable Patrick Bateman is throughout the entire movie. But like everybody knows that he's a dork. Like he, that scene, like anybody in the world, if you and I had a friend who quoted Ed Gein, actually, I think it's misquoted. He's it's supposed to, uh, the quote actually is supposed I'm to be usually someone's it, friend who talks about Ed Gein. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I know who you're talking about, too. But, like, actually, it's a misquote. It's, it's supposed to be attributed to Ed Kemper. But he quotes Ed Gein in the movie, and he, like, he thinks it's hysterical. Yeah. Which is, like, to me, that's a little bit of the mask slipping. Like, that's part of, like, yeah. not understanding what other... When he starts that's not getting understanding. sweaty, those scenes are always interesting. Yeah. But then, actually, one of my favorite scenes is uh, when he breaks up with Evelyn. Right after yeah. the chainsaw thing, which is another reason I think the chainsaw thing's fake because he's drawing it. He's like drawing it on in crayon on the on the brunch table, but that scene to me is I there's a scene there's like there's great lines in that like where he's like you're not terribly important to me and she's just like sobbing, but for me the scene is where she's like you're in human. He goes no no I'm in touch with humanity, like that to me is that to me is someone who has absolutely no idea what's going on in their life. Like they're so bent out of shape about everything. Everything's gone haywire. Like he almost lost this person who he tried to murder. Like they're so to speak, depending on your perception of the reality of the situation. But like yeah. his conceit of reality is so warped that he thinks that the way he's treated, the way he's acted towards people is somehow more humane and more human than anything else. It's it's a really fascinating moment in the movie for me, especially towards the end. Like for him to actually give a shit or try to give a shit. Or just him actually pursuing some true interest, which is... Well, murder. to like actually care what anybody thinks about him. Like I think that's another thing. I know he cares all the time about what everybody thinks about him, but to like... Not to, like, care about what Evelyn thinks. Like, Evelyn is so unimportant to him. is fascinating to me. Even I don't though, think he cares about what she thinks at all. I think she's another element of his mask. And in sure, one moment, he's like, you know what? Fuck it. Like, they can catch me. That's what it feels like, that 
that frenzied running from the cops and shooting janitors bit is, mm -hmm. is it's his desperate plea to be caught, right? And you, they talk a lot about this in different serial killer shit I've seen. Is that that's why I like BTK starts sending letters to the cops and that's what gets him busted. It's because they have this, they almost in a weird, perverse way want to be caught so they can be acknowledged, right? right? For the individual and great achievements they've made. And so, because there's a scene when I can't remember, he, it's after one of his horrific acts. Whether he just kills a lady and we kind of hint at it, something like that, right? And then we cut to him just getting like a massage and like, your face is so smooth. And he starts talking, right? And he's like, um, I have all the characteristics of a human being. He goes on ad nauseum and then he's like, you know, but I feel my mask of sanity slipping. And right. I think in that moment is where we start doing more sweaty Bateman, more the kills are kind of ramping up. Right. And now we're getting into this. We don't know. Cause at the end when Gene finds his journal is like his planner. Yeah. yeah. And you know, there's like shotguns up, up in it. You know what I mean? Like horrifying shit. Yeah. Now are we to imagine that that is where all of this has taken place is in that one day planner. Or there's a lot of my theory is right. Whenever he says I'm taking back video or I have videotapes to return. Mm -hmm. That's him going to watch his kills. Right, that that's when he goes back and watches what he did to like get back in his Patrick Bateman zone. Like, you think he actually tapes them? Yeah, I think he tapes a lot oh. of his kills. Like when he no. has the threesome, I think he goes back and watches that for a fix. I think it's just a. <laughs> I think it's just a lame excuse. Like, I, I <laughs> the, here's this is why. And it's it comes up early in the movie, but this is why, like, anytime he says it, it's funny because it's a bit, but, like, it's a bad excuse because every single time he says it, it's either to get out of an uncomfortable situation, like with Evelyn, or it is to give him some... Some sense of uh, of some sense of plausible deniability. The first time he meets Kimball, he goes, "Do you do you remember your whereabouts the night of like Paul Allen's just, hmm. probably returning? Tapes. I was probably returning videotapes. He was like, probably that making takes, them and or jerking off to them. That takes like five seconds though. Like there's there's like there's this um, <laughs> there's just but see I don't think he's making the tapes because like when he's working out. Which originally, when the scene starts, I'm like, is he jerking off and watching Texas Chainsaw Massacre? That's how far removed we are from exercise that we just assume well, he's jerking. Well, what would I be doing laying on the floor? Jerking off, of course. Jerking off. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you can do ab things from there? The first time I, wa the first time I watched it, I remember being like, is because the first time I watched it, like, the scream happens so quickly. And it sort of, it has such a volume to it. The first time I watched it and like the cut is to like this like half eaten fig and like fizzy water. I was like, oh, shit, did he like poison some lady? And she's just like screaming bloody murder. And then, of course, like it cuts to like Texas Chainsaw Mask. I'm like, oh, OK, cool. Never mind. But like that, I think to me, speaks to where we're at in the movie mm -hmm. where he'll just do like the, it, like insane shit like that starts happening. But well, he's just like doing crunches. As and shit. we know, Patrick Bateman is obviously a huge fan of physical media. He's not yes. a renter. He's a buyer. So I, he's a, I don't well, think well, so. he's clearly a renter of some kind. I don't think so. Well, I know he rented inside Lydia's ass. That was a real. <laughs> you think that wasn't a purchase? <laughs> no way. Yeah, that's his other closet where he has his neatly quaffed. He absolutely would not get caught with fucking pornos in his house. No way. I feel like Zagat and porn is the exact energy Patrick Bateman's giving off the whole movie. I think Zagat is porn for Patrick Bateman. <laughs> <laughs> the whole movie. He's like, I'm either going to kill a hooker off to that or jerk off to Zagat tonight. I can't decide. <laughs> yeah, I mean, perhaps right. But that's what... <laughs> I... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I uh, I don't know, man. I I think he kills a lot more people than I think. I think it is I think it is widely accepted in the film community what you're saying. And I think what a lot of people focus I think it's a on popular is that theory. This I do is not American think it's an accepted psycho theory. more than psycho, right? And that a lot of sure. what we're playing with is the greed is good, the capitalism, right? The 1% bullshit. We're playing with that more. 
But then you're asking, is this a movie where I feel sad for a man who's like being crumbled by the stress of daddy's success in Wall Street and having naughty fantasies? Or do I want this guy to actually be a murderer? And I guess it's a weird thing to have to confront in yourself, but <laughs> I'd like to think he's an actual murderer. I think it's much more compelling in a weird way because uh, we keep coming back to this point, but they're all kind of fake and psychotic. He's just the only one like butchering human beings, right? And I think one of the moments with Gene is actually really interesting. This could be a good case study for how you f see this movie, right? So when Gene's there and they're kind of talking, is he actually pulling out the nail gun? Does he actually have like cabinets full of tools, whatever? Is Take there actually a head in the freezer? Yeah. Yeah. Is there a head in the freezer by the sorbet or whatever? When he sits down, right? And uh, Evelyn calls and leaves that voicemail. And Gene is pretty much asking him, like, affair? Yes, you want to do an affair? Let's do an affair. And he goes, I think you should leave. I can't control myself. If you stay, I'm afraid I'll hurt you. And she thinks he's talking about, like, boyfriend, girlfriend hurting, right? Mm -hmm. That scene is fascinating whether you agree more with what you're saying or more with what I'm saying, right? Is Why hold back on Gene, right? Because you could say, like, from a criminal mind, well, she's a secretary. If she goes missing... He'd probably be the most fucking likely one, right? right? But take it out further than that, right? Is this someone who's in his life and has helped take Because when he asks her, he's wearing sunglasses. He's very flippant, right? It's a very strange moment for uh, Patrick. I think this is right after he thinks he's cleared of the Paul Allen thing. Because, yeah. again, he was mistaken for being at a dinner with Halversham or whatever. Right. So maybe he's feeling a little up on it. And then in talking to Gene, he feels something. Right. What do you think's happening in that moment? The in his in his office or in the apartment? No, at his apartment when he's sitting there making that choice. Right. Why not say, yeah, let's fuck. I'll get my camera and then kill Jean. Or why let her leave? Right. Like this is the she's truly the one I that think... gets away without any injury. Right. Because the other two girls, he releases it so they can say they had a threesome with Paul Allen. Well, I think Jean. I think Gene's the only one who's seen him. I I don't know. I don't know. I never really thought of it like that, to be honest. So do you I think this assume... scene is him saying, I am someone who hurts women and I don't want to add you to my list? Or is this a guy who's looking at his possible first victim? I think it's that. Yeah. I would say it's probably cl not I think first not, victim. Maybe his strong. first non-homeless victim. I would say it's probably the first victim of someone he knows too well. Okay. Like to that, cause that point he'd only killed a homeless man, Reggie Cathy, and then uh, the hooker or almost the hooker, I guess. Yeah. Or no, the hooker. Sorry. And he says like, in his confession that wait, he's killed no, a bunch of homeless sorry. people. The woman he killed, the, the shot is, is she a hooker? Or is she just some random person on the street? The, no, he's the, walking the home. lady who kind of is like, Hey creep. And then she looks at him. She's like fucking cheek. Bones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then that's that the head hooker? in the freezer. No, that's just, the yeah, lady that's the, head. Yeah, that's just a lady. That's the head in the freezer. Yeah. That one. I mean. And that's where we see her. The next thing we see is the bloody sheets. So we're right. to in, we're to assume that he murdered her. Well, no, the next thing we see is him like with her hair. No, no, no that was a different blonde lady. It was? Yeah. Because there's the one where he's like twirling the blonde hair around. Yeah. That's the lady from the club. The model, when she's like, do you think oh, I'm dumb? Oh, yeah. Sorry. And yeah, in theory, he could have gotten her hair in a more traditionally so many, manner. So many murdered sandy blonde women, I just cannot keep them straight in this movie. Um, yeah, I yeah, don't I, I feel know. like, because I, I honestly thought that was maybe a moment where he saw something in Jean that he didn't want to destroy her, right? Because everyone else in the film... I think because everybody else is dis disingenuous. Like everybody else in the film is trying to get something. They're trying to be someone else. Gene is Gene's. I mean, to put it frankly, Gene's Gene's normal. Gene doesn't have Gene doesn't have Gene is not vain. The whole like the very beginning where he like comments on her clothing and then tells him what she, what he likes and that kind of stuff. Like, she's not vain. She simply dresses as she dresses. Yeah. Well, I think that had they made it to Dorcia, she would have gotten killed. That's what I settled on. Because when she said. Well, they said, were never going to go to Dorcia. But when though. she said, I want to go to Dorcia, 
I think in his mind, he goes, you're just like the rest of them. Right. And then somewhere in that apartment. Sure. As he seemingly is trying to figure out how to kill her and not listening. I think something happens. And he said, for some reason, hearing Evelyn, I'm not sure why he decides this is not the time to kill her. Because I think when she said Doris, yeah, he's fully ready to commit yeah. this crime. And I have never quite settled on why he lets her leave. I think she's just, I mean, I think the easy thing is to say that she's, she, she's the one that's going to get him caught. She's the one that would get you busted because that's the easy, but that's the, little, the, that's the thrill the, kink is high with that though. So who knows? I don't know. Right. So I don't know. That's a good question. That's a really, that's if, a scene I, I've I don't never I don't know if I can answer settled on. Yeah. Too. No, I agree. It's a strange scene for the movie in general because yeah. it does take place in reality, but aspects of it for me are not real and some parts of it are very real. Yeah. I don't know. Because also, if you're just a dork who doesn't kill people, it's like maybe getting like a, you know, some sex on your resume helps give you some cred. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, obviously, since we're cool, we haven't had to worry about things like this. <laughs> Either way, I... um. I don't know. This is like, this is like the fun of this movie in general for me is just, I like having this conversation because it, it's not overtly educational and like laden with nonsense film critique. What it is, is just a matter of perception of how you want to, how do you want to accept Patrick Bateman? And I think that's what makes American psycho a strong movie and a worthwhile watch is because when you watch it, you say, do I accept Patrick Bateman as the person that he's presenting to us? Or do I accept him as the person that he actually is? There's no, like we were talking, we've been saying this, this is the th- third time we're going to say it or me at least Patrick Bateman is not cool. That's like the whole point of the bit is that Patrick Bateman is not a cool person. He's only cool to himself or at least he thinks he's cool, but all the things that would make you cool, he doesn't do because all he wants to talk about is how cool he is. It's an interesting character. Yeah, and it's I, a great character. I think study. it gets back to the Stepford Whites thing, right? Where they're all so interchangeable, <laughs> and when that's your, right. when that's your whole goal is just to buy the best of whatever the fuck it is. Like, there's just not going to be a lot of you left that matters, right? You've set yourself up as that, and you can never win. And the movie yeah. kind of ends pretty on the nose with the the Reagan thing, right? Yeah, and they're like, how does he just lie like that? How does he do it? <laughs> They talk about it's the it, best. It's the best yuppie thing. Cause this is the guy who made him rich. Yeah. I mean, and so then he cuts into this, you know, but on the inside and he goes, my punishment will never find me this and that. And he goes, mm-hmm. my confession has meant nothing. And so I think what the movie in a way is telling you is that I, cause I don't think this movie means nothing, man. And I think going on Patrick Bateman's Jersey doesn't journey doesn't mean nothing to me. I think maybe it's what you're saying is that you can glean. Don't take it as this literal journey, right? This literal whorehouse, you know, whorehouse, right. H-O. <laughs> right. And whorehouse, too. It's both. It's both of the whorehouses. But it's don't take it as that journey. Right. Look at it as this man grappling with this fucking inner rage. Look at it as the fucking rich people can do whatever the fuck they want and treat the rest of us wrong. You can find whatever, you know, the people that just talk in Zagat reviews in New York Times about articles, right? Because they think that makes them interesting, but inside they can't feel anything those songs would be about. Right. I think that's what I'll take away, right? Is that I I feel like this movie, for as surreal and absurd as it is at times, I think Patrick Bateman is a real example of how we are trapped in these flesh bodies. And I think it's hard. And I think it's hard to never have control of your life. And I think some people fucking violently react to that and are just built wrong. And I think what makes a guy like Bateman scary is that when you look good and you're rich, is that there are just fucking fields that you are able to fucking hunt in that other people can't. And I, I just, I think this movie's scary, man. And I think he does kill in this movie. Um, But more than anything, I I think it's just a director who had a perfect vision of how to do this movie. You know, and I, I think just agreed. Those two, Christian Bale and Mary Heron coming together, I think they just gave us this perfectly unique and quirky horror film. I agree. I think that it's it's perfectly executed and it's rare to say that in movies, but yeah. 
it's perfectly. I, I do have two things before. Um, do you know who the original director who they tried to get to originally direct when uh, Ed Pressman bought the rights to the book? Wes Craven. Stuart Gordon. Really? Oh, yes. See, I would have liked that. And then so you would have uh, had Barbara thing, Crampton in it and all that. <laughs> <laughs> and the second thing is for anyone who's watching this on YouTube, this is my, I, I okay. Uh, Justin Thoreau does this. There's no way he actually does this in, in life. This is how he looks when he dances, but there's a scene where he dances in this movie and I laugh hysterically every time. And I think I watch it. I'm going to do it right now. What are we doing? We're doing a fucking visual. So yeah. Okay. Alex is going for it. <laughs> But yeah, the dancing in the movie in and of itself is an issue. It's just an issue. amazing. Yeah, it's but that's what I mean, man. This movie is just full of memorable moments. And I don't think it, it matters as much to put them in a place of fact, right? I think it's just a movie you sit and kind Not of ponder all. and experience with, man. Agreed. That's it for American Psycho. That's it for today's double feature. Thank you again, Aaron, uh, for your Good picks. double feature, man. Oh, it was a great one. Uh, again, patreon.com slash pod. You can get in on the fun of getting the movies you want to hear discuss on the show. Uh, Film Alchemist on YouTube. Subscribe there. Film Alchemist pod on G- at gmail.com or find us on all the social media you're on. That's a great place to get a hold of us. All right. Next month, we embark on an epic journey. The pod gets real. It's documentary the journey self. month. Yeah. So we're doing four documentaries next month. It will be a challenge that we are hopefully up to the task for. We're scared. It's going to be fun. It's new territory. We've never done a documentary before. And we're beginning with The Act of Killing, perhaps my favorite documentary of all time. It was yeah, good. It's not It's not uh, as easy breezy affair as this chainsaw murdering. <laughs> <laughs> for the film alchemist, I'm Josh Griffey. I'm Alex Dandino. <laughs> <laughs>